headlines. President Park Geun-hye calls for innovation and service industries to create jobs and boost growth. The government announced measures to support the launch of foreign hospitals and ease daily price change limits on the stock market. The U.S. calls for quick formation of a new cabinet in Iraq that's locked in a fierce power struggle. And actor Robin Williams was found dead at his California home. He's known to have battled a severe depression. Officials say he apparently took his own life. He was 63. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We begin with the Korean government's plan to make the country's service sector a new growth engine. It says it's supporting the launch of foreign hospitals and easing limits on daily stock price changes. Hwang Jie has the details. The government will cut red tape, write special laws and promote competition to help develop seven service sectors into a new growth engine. During a meeting led by President Park Geun-hye on Tuesday, the government identified medical, tourism, financial distribution, software, contents and education industries as promising service sectors and confirmed a string of measures to boost investment in them. We will create momentum for our economy to escape from its heavy dependence on exports and the manufacturing industry and will aim for growth that's led by the service sector and domestic demand. It will streamline regulations to lure foreign for-profit hospitals and provide subsidies for hospitals that attract foreign patients to Korea. The plans call for more than doubling the number of foreign patients to 500,000 by 2017 from 210,000 last year. It will also push through four resort complex development plans on the islands of Yeongjongdo and Jeju that will boost investments by around eight and a half billion U.S. dollars. Regulatory reform will also take place in the nation's financial sector. The government will gradually ease the current 15 percent limit on daily stock price movement to 30 percent. It expects the measure to stimulate the local stock market and strengthen the market's price-setting mechanism. Although there are concerns that it could fuel will stock price volatility. Overall, the measures, which come as part of President Park's three-year economic innovation plan, are expected to boost investment by around $14.5 billion and create 180,000 jobs. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea's trade ministry also unveiled its plans to support locally oriented small and mid-sized companies in going global by helping them find clients abroad. Here is our Song ji with more. If things pan out as the government hopes, some 10,000 small and mid-sized companies will find new buyers overseas to more than double their sales in the next three years. That, ministry officials say, will likely more than triple the number of workers employed by these companies. They cited a report by the Korea International Trade Association saying job growth at exporting companies is four times higher than those relying solely on the domestic market. The trade ministry will designate scores of trading houses to help match the companies with foreign buyers and develop a program to dispatch retired trading experts to help them utilize new export channels. In a meeting with trade officials on Tuesday, President Park Geun-hye stressed the need for the government to provide support for the smaller companies that lack experience when they expand overseas. The government will also take steps to make online commerce more profitable for them by streamlining online documentation procedures by the end of this month. In addition, the government will set aside additional 1.6 billion U.S. dollars in soft loans to help these new exporters link up with overseas customers and provide better insurance arrangements to protect them from currency fluctuations. Song ji Arirang News. Korea is busy touching up on final preparations for Pope Francis' visit later this week. And ahead of his arrival, the Catholic Church in Korea has released a special message as well. Park ji tells us more. Ahead of the Pope's five-day visit to Korea later this week, the Catholic Church in Korea released a special statement on Tuesday. 
I think the Pope's traveling to Korea, the farthest eastern part of Asia, because the Pope wishes to pray for peace on the Korean Peninsula and in Asia. The Pope's visit aims to embrace people who are suffering. Pope Francis always reaches out to people in need of help and those who are suffering. I believe the Pope will deliver a message of consolation and of hope to those whose hearts have been broken in the spirit of St. Peter. During his trip, the Pope plans to meet with people from diverse walks of life, including Korean victims of Japan's wartime sex enslavement and the bereaved families of those who died in April's ferry disaster. And now with only a couple of days until the Pope's visit, the country is in full swing preparing for the Holy Father's visit. The preparatory committee says extreme care will be paid to protecting the 77-year-old Pope, and they are going over his schedule and the rehearsals for event. An official media center has been set up at a short distance from Myeongdong Cathedral. It will be open from Wednesday through Monday for the some 2,800 reporters from all the world who are covering the papal visit. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. South Korea awaits North Korea's response to its offer for high-level talks, but Pyongyang's official media is pressing ahead with its hostile campaign against the South Korean government. Seoul appears determined, though, to soothe tensions on the Korean peninsula. Hwang Sung-hee has more. A day after South Korea's surprise proposal for dialogue, North Korea threatened further provocation should Seoul and Washington go ahead with their joint Ulti Freedom Guardian military exercises next week. North Korea's state-run Dodong Shimun warned Tuesday its threats of retaliation against such war games should not be taken as empty words. It accused the South of turning a blind eye on nuclear threats from the United States while wickedly pressing Pyongyang to give up what it calls justified nuclear program in the North as a precondition to building trust. This as Seoul awaits Pyongyang's response to its offer for high-level talks next Tuesday at the border village of Panmunjom to discuss issues of mutual concern. Seoul officials have indicated that the South is willing to discuss Pyongyang's demands to lift South Korean sanctions on North Korea and allow southern tourists to resume tours to the North Korean resort of Mount Kumgang. The offer for dialogue followed Seoul's decision to provide Pyongyang more than 13 million U.S. dollars in aid through the World Food Program and the World Health Organization. President Park Geun-hye is expected to introduce further measures to better ties in her Liberation Day speech on Friday. The shift in tone comes after months of tensions between the two Koreas. But whether Seoul will stick to its fresh strategy of using the carrot will depend entirely on Pyongyang's next move. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. A group of North Korean defectors have been captured by Chinese guards as they were trying to cross the border into Laos. A, clo a close source said 11 female North Koreans, including a child, were arrested in the Chinese border city of Kunming Tuesday morning. Defectors trying to make it into Southeast Asian countries from China must cross the border from Kunming, but the city has bolstered regulations since early this year. South Korea's foreign ministry said it contacted the foreign ministry in China requesting for the safety of the defectors and that they be sent to a region of their wish. A U.S.-based website, 38 North, says recent satellite images suggest Pyongyang may have completed preparations at its Punggye nuclear test site, pointing to the fact that no new activity has been detected there in recent months. If the test site is in fact prepped and ready to go, 38 North says related personnel would only be waiting for an order to test fire. Given past experiences with the regime, the website estimates that it will take about six to eight weeks to conduct a detonation once an order is received. North Korea last tested its nuclear program in February last year. A former U.N. Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women has heavily criticized Japan for its lack of repentance on the wartime sexual slavery issue. Our Yurian has more. 
Marking the 50 years since the end of World War II in 1996, Radhika Kumaraswamy released a report to the UN on the history of Japan's military sexual enslavement to raise international awareness over the issue. She concluded through the report that Japan's enslavement of foreign women was a violation of international law and urged Tokyo to make an official apology. And from what we saw and heard from these comfort women, it was very clear that it was a situation of slavery. Um, uh, they were kept uh, in very small cubicles and in little cubicles and were given um, uh, and were made to um, uh, take care of Japanese soldiers. Quite a large number actually, um, but sort of more than eight a day at least. So it was a situation to us of slavery. Japan did make a partial apology back in 1993 through the Kono Statement, but recently re-examined the document, casting doubt on whether its admittance of coercing women into sexual slavery was based on solid evidence. But Kumara Swami says there's ample evidence. Looking at some historical material uh, on this issue, uh, uh, as well as um, interviews with Japanese women's NGOs, uh, makes it very clear that this is mostly coercive. Maybe. She went on to say that Japan's efforts to legitimize the sexual enslavement system during that time period simply made no sense. And of course this happened because the Japanese army felt this was better than letting the army loose on the civilian population. There had been a lot of rapes in Nanking. And so it responded by having this, this system of military sexual slavery. But that's not a response uh, by any stretch of the imagination. You have to Expressing frustration over Japan's recent hardline stance, Kumara Swami emphasized that Japan needs to provide the victims the compensation and justice they so deserve. Um, it is very clear from the evidence that these, this was a coercive set of practices. It is also very clear that it did not come up in the Tokyo discussions. So why not accept uh, uh, do, the, do the right thing? apologize and give compensation. What, why is it not being done? I think and that is UDN, Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Kang Cheri for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8, every weeknight on Arirang TV. Human Rights Council headquarters in Geneva on Thursday finding ways to persuade... Prosecutors have decided not to indict the late de facto owner of the sunken Sewerho ferry, Yu Byung-un, for embezzlement and tax evasion. Prosecutors said in their interim report that there was no legal basis to pursue charges against the deceased Yu. However, the prosecution has indicted his eldest son, Yu Dae-gyun, on charges of misappropriating more than $7 million, as well as two others for helping him evade capture. The Yu family's corrupt business practices, including cargo overload, are widely believed to have, led to have led to the April ferry disaster that took the lives of more than 300 people. 1,800 Hyundai car owners will be eligible to receive up to $390 in compensation over its inaccurate information regarding fuel mileage. But this payout most likely won't be enough to settle a number of lawsuits against this company. Sun jung -in has more. In a press release Tuesday, Hyundai Motor said it has decided to revise the fuel economy label on its Santa Fe model vehicles from 14.4 kilometers per liter of diesel to 13.8 kilometers and compensate owners up to 390 U.S. dollars. The company said the voluntary measure is in response to a ruling by Korea's transportation ministry, which said the fuel economy of the mid-size SUV was exaggerated and instructed them to take follow-up measures. Hyundai denies intentionally exaggerating its fuel economy figures and added that some discrepancies could occur in the mileage depending on the standards and methods of calculation. They came up with a $390 figure by calculating the national average for mileage of SUVs, which came to 14,527 kilometers per year. The compensation does not preclude Hyundai Motor from lawsuit, though. 
The owners of nearly 1,800 vehicles spread over six different models, including the Santa Fe, have filed suits seeking up to around $3,000 for failure to state the correct fuel efficiency. A lawyer working on behalf of the group said they cannot accept the $390 in compensation as it is too low, nearly half of what companies in the U.S. would offer. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Korea's smallest handset manufacturer, Pantech, has filed for court receivership due to severe cash shortages. The company said it would use all means at its disposal to normalize management as soon as possible. Pantech has been overdue in paying back some tens of millions of dollars in bonds and on top of this failed to secure enough cash to repay debt that was due on Monday. The Seoul Central District Court will decide whether to accept this court receivership receivership. If it does, Pantech will have to submit its normalization plan to the court within two months. Pantech holds about 10 percent of Korea's domestic handset market share. With Korea's stock markets having moved pretty much sideways in recent years, a large number of minority shareholders have been forced to sell up. Market research provider Tebar.com says that nearly half a million shareholders among the 100 largest domestic companies in Korea have shunned stocks over the last 12 months. Most notably, SK Hynix, once a favorite for private investors, lost more than 100,000 share owners, while Tuzan Heavy Industries and Kia Motors also suffered significant drops. Companies like Hana Financial Group, LG Display and Samsung Electronics, however, attracted more minority shareholders over the past year, with the number ranging from 8,000 to 30,000. A political storm is brewing in Baghdad as Iraq's new president names a new prime minister to replace Nuri al-Maliki. With more, Paul is joining us from the News Center. Paul, it appears that Baghdad is facing a political showdown amid an already deeply divided government. Right, and to add to that, the rift between the ousted Prime Minister Maliki and President Faoud Masoon came to full view on Monday. Maliki and his supporters say they won't go down without a fight, denouncing the move as a violation of the Constitution. Washington has welcomed the appointment of Hadar al-Abadi. This as U.S. airstrikes continue to fend off militants in the north of the country. Our Shin Zemin has the latest. Iraqi President Fouad Massoum has named a prime minister to end Nouri al-Maliki's eight-year rule, but Maliki is refusing to go after deploying special forces on the streets of Baghdad. Speaking on state television Monday, Massoum said he hopes Haider Ali Badi would succeed in forming a new government that would protect the Iraqi people and unify the country against a growing threat of radical Sunni militants. But the president's public rejection for Maliki's bid for third term has raised the stakes in the fierce battle for political control. Ibadi now has 30 days to form a new government that can win parliamentary approval. However, Maliki accused Masum of carrying out a coup against the constitution and the political process. Maliki's Shiite-dominated bloc won the most parliament seats in April's election. U.S. President Barack Obama welcomed Masum's decision. He said it was an important step on a path towards a more inclusive government that will unite Iraq's different communities. Urge all Iraqi political leaders to work peacefully through the political process in the days ahead. Now, this new Iraqi leadership has a difficult task. It, the United States stands ready to support a government that addresses the needs and grievances of all Iraqi people. Meanwhile, Kurdish forces continue their battle against Islamic State militants in the north and west of Iraq with the help of American airstrikes. U.S. aircraft on Monday hit four militant checkpoints and destroyed several of the group's vehicles near Mount Sinjar, where thousands of people of the Yazidi religious sect have taken refuge. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. 
And now to news that's left to so many fans around the world. Shocked, I would say, and saddened. A beloved actor and comedian Robin Williams has been found dead at his home in California. Paul, what were the circumstances behind his death? Well, authorities say the 63-year-old had recently been suffering from severe depression and has believed he had been taken his own life. Messages of condolences have been pouring following his death from friends, celebrities, and even heads of state. Among them includes director Steven Spielberg, who said Robin was a lightning storm of comic genius and her laughter was a thunder that sustained him. Our Kim Ji takes a look back at this prolific entertainer. Actor and comedian Robin Williams has died at the age of 63. According to Marine County Police, Williams was pronounced dead shortly after noon on Monday local time in an apparent suicide at his home in Northern California. Preliminary cause of death is believed to be asphyxia. His publicist says the actor had been battling severe depression of late. In a statement, his wife Susan Schneider says she was utterly heartbroken over losing her husband and best friend and asked people to remember Williams for the countless moments of joy and laughter he gave to millions. Born in Chicago in 1951, Williams studied theater at Juilliard School in New York. He entered into the homes and hearts of America as an alien visitor in the 1970s TV series Mork and Mindy. He went on to act in more than a hundred television shows and movies, starring as a lovable father turned nanny in Mrs. Doubtfire and a fatherly therapist in Goodwill Hunting, which won him an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. In the past, Williams had openly talked about his battle with alcohol and drugs, and he recently visited a rehabilitation center to, as he put it, fine tune his sobriety. Kim Min Ji, Arirang News. Yes, uh, like the board said there, uh, he will be missed. And uh, moving on to some other stories of the day, the FBI has opened a probe into the death of 18-year-old Michael Brown, who was gunned down by police in the state of Missouri. Paul, it looks like tensions remain high in the community at large following this tragedy. Absolutely. Public outrage erupted over the weekend on the killing, with some civil rights leaders drawing parallels to the shooting of 17-year-old African-American Trayvon Martin back in 2012. A second night of rioting broke out on Tuesday in the city of Ferguson after police had been firing tear gas at hundreds of demonstrators, with 15 arrested a day ago. The teen's parents has urged the public to refrain from violence while demanding a fair investigation. It was funny, silly, it would make you laugh. Any problems that would be going on or any situation, it wasn't nothing that he couldn't solve. He would bring people back together. He's a good boy. He didn't deserve none of this. None of it. We need justice for our son. We need justice for our son. The circumstances surrounding the shooting are still unclear, with witnesses and police providing conflicting testimonies. On one side of the story is that the teenager was unarmed with his hands in the air when an officer opened fire. But the other side is that Brown attacked the police officer in an attempt to take his gun. In the meantime, the FBI says it will be monitoring the probe being carried out by St. Louis County Police in addition to its civil rights investigation. I see. And finally, Paul, the World Health Organization has authorized the use of experimental drugs to treat the deadly Ebola virus as the death toll from this outbreak reaches over 1,000. Now, give us the details on this ruling. Well, the UN Health Agency said on Tuesday that it determined the use of experimental treatments for patients infected with Ebola is ethical. Now, what this means is that it could pave the way for additional resources and less red tape in distributing these unproven drugs. According to the WHO, a panel of medical experts reached a consensus to offer the Ebola treatments due to the overwhelming circumstances of the viral outbreak in West Africa. But they stressed that the effectiveness and possible adverse effects of the drugs were not yet fully known. The announcement comes as a Spanish missionary who was being treated for the deadly disease died in a hospital in Madrid. If confirmed, it would mark one of the first Ebola-related deaths outside of Africa. WHO says the current outbreak in, in West Africa has now killed 1,013 people as health authorities race to find a possible cure or vaccine. Chetty? All right, uh, Paul, thank you very much for that update. Uh, it's always good to have you with us, and we'll see you back here in just about two hours.
Good evening, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. As you can see, skies are looking pretty clear across the nation, except in the southern regions and some of the western coastal areas stuck under a layer of fog. Now, it was a hot day here in Korea. However, as we are moving into the evening, temperatures will make a big drop down into the low 20s, so make sure to have a sweater handy. Now, tomorrow, expect a slight decrease in daytime highs as the mercury peaks into the high 20s under mostly cloudy conditions. Now, going over to our temperature readings, Tor will top out the Wednesday morning at 22 before reaching up to 28 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will top out at 29 and 28 degrees. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops over to 28, while Tokdo and Mangkungang tops to 26. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and back to you, Teddy. Thank you very much, Michelle. And that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.